The following content is brought to you by Chilton Evangelical Church in Manchester, UK. Our location is M21 9FG. Our Sunday services are at 11 a.m. and 6:30 p.m. For more information, visit our website chiltonevangelical.org. Well, if you'd like to have your Bibles open then at the passage that we just read in 2 Peter and in chapter 1. And tonight we're going to be looking really at the uh, the opening four verses. And uh, what we have uh, in those verses uh, essentially is, is one long sentence. And um, it's quite a complicated sentence with lots of parts to it. And uh, so our, our aim tonight is going to be to go through that sentence and uh, try and unpack uh, what it is that Peter is saying to us. And to try and help us to do that, um, we're going to be going through these verses by, uh, by asking and answering a series of questions. And our first question is a very straightforward one. Who wrote this letter? Verse 1 tells us that it came from Simon Peter. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. So this is Peter, isn't it? The fisherman who became a disciple of Jesus. The Peter that we read so much about in the Gospels and uh, in the book of Acts. A great man. The man who plays the, the leading role in the foundation of uh, the establishing of that, of the early church. But Peter describes himself as a servant, really a slave of Jesus Christ. This, uh, this great man, he dedicated his whole life to unreservedly serving his master, the Lord Jesus. So why should we listen to him? Well, firstly, uh, the fact that this letter comes to us from Peter, it means that we're dealing here with primary source material. Peter wants to, to tell us, doesn't he, about the Lord Jesus. Well, he's an eyewitness of Jesus. He met Jesus. He heard Jesus. He knew Jesus. This is a first-hand account of the gospel. So that means it's reliable it's accurate, it's trustworthy. But a second reason, and perhaps even more important, is because Peter is an apostle of Jesus Christ. And of course, what that means is that Peter was, was personally appointed by Jesus himself to be one of his official spokesmen. And so when Peter speaks as an apostle, he speaks with all the authority of Jesus Christ. Himself. It's as if Jesus himself is speaking to us. So I hope we're paying attention. So who is Peter writing to? Who is this letter for? Well, in verse 1, Peter says he's writing to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours. So Peter is writing to people who have faith. So he's writing to believers. He's writing to Christians. But he says these people have obtained that faith. Now the word obtained, it means really to be, uh, to be chosen by lot to receive something. So Peter says he's writing to people who have been chosen by God to receive the great gift of faith. And so if you're a believer here tonight, and then Peter is writing to you. Peter is writing to us. And Peter says, if you have faith, well, it's a faith of equal standing with his, with him and with the other apostles. And of course, that should be a, a great encouragement to us, shouldn't it? There are not different levels of Christians, different classes of Christians. God doesn't give some people great faith and others a, a sort of lesser quality version. God puts us all on an equal footing. We have a faith of equal standing, even with the great apostles. It's a great encouragement, but also a great challenge. If we have been given such a great gift, if we have been entrusted with such a great faith, a faith of equal standing even with the apostles themselves, 
Well, that means then we are without excuse if we are not growing. Now, yes, we, we all have different gifts. We all have different opportunities, different challenges, different callings. But it does mean, doesn't it, we can't start making excuses for ourselves if we are not growing. We're all building on the same foundation. We have obtained a faith of equal standing. So why then is Peter writing? Well, Peter is worried. He's concerned about the Christians that he can see around him. He doesn't doubt their faith. He doesn't doubt their sincerity. But he can see that they're no longer making the effort to grow as believers. They no longer seem to have that, that hunger to, to increase in their understanding of the Bible. He can see them becoming careless in their attitudes towards sin. They're just coasting along with the misguided presumption that everything will be fine. But Peter can see the very real dangers that lie ahead for any believer if they continue on that sort of path. It's a bit like riding a bicycle. You're riding along on your bicycle, you're pedaling along, but then you stop pedaling. But at first, you're okay. You can, you can coast along a little way, can't you? But if you don't start pedaling again soon, gradually you start to go slower and slower and slower. Then you start to wobble around a little bit. Then you start to wobble around a lot. And eventually you're going to fall off. Well, these Christians that Peter's writing to, these Christians have stopped pedaling. They're no longer pressing on. They're no longer pressing forward. They're just coasting. Now, outwardly, everything may seem okay at the moment, but when trials and troubles come along, when opposition comes or persecution, when false teaching comes along, when temptation comes along, they're not alert to these dangers. They're not prepared to face them. And so they are vulnerable. The same is true, isn't it, for any one of us. And so Peter is writing to stir us up. We've seen already as we uh, read through that, uh, uh, those opening verses, some of the language that Peter uses in his letter. Make every effort, he says. Be diligent. Pay attention. Take care. There's an, there's an urgency in Peter's words. We can't afford to just sit back and take it easy in our Christian lives. All the way through this letter, Peter is warning us. He's urging us. He's exhorting us. He wants to provoke us. He wants to stir us up. He wants a reaction from us. He wants us to do something. Well, what does Peter want for us? Is this letter just Peter with a, hitting us with a big stick? Is he just going to scold us and rebuke us all the way through the letter? Well, look what Peter says to us in verse 2. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Now, as believers, we have grace. We have peace. But Peter knows that we need more. And so he prays, doesn't he, that grace and peace will be multiplied to us, that we will have an abundance of grace and peace, that these things will be, will be overflowing to us. Well, is this Peter just engaging in some formal pleasantries? Is he just trying to find something nice as he begins his letter? Well, no. Peter really means it. Well, how is that going to happen then? How will grace and peace be multiplied to us? Well, Peter tells us in verse 2. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Grace and peace 
will be multiplied to us. Our experience of grace, our experience of peace will increase as our knowledge increases. As our knowledge of God, as our knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ increases, so these things will be, will be multiplied to us. So we have to ask that question then, don't we? Is our knowledge increasing? Is your knowledge increasing? And what are you doing to make sure that it's increasing? Do you know and understand more about God, more about the Lord Jesus, more about the gospel, more about the Bible now than you did last week or last month or last year? And if not, well, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do to make sure that if you're asked that question next week, next month, next year, that the answer is yes? Well, how important is this? How important is it that our knowledge is increasing? Well, look at verse Three. There Peter tells us, his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So in verse 2, Peter prayed that grace and peace would be multiplied to us. But now here in verse 3, Peter says that God has in fact given us all things, all things that pertain to life and and godliness. And so as well as grace and peace, God has given us everything that we need to live godly lives here in this world. But how do these all things, how do all these things come to us? Well, in the same way that grace and peace come to us. Look again at, at verse 3. Peter says, his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. So all the things that we need to live a godly life here in this world, they come to us in the same way, through our knowledge of God, through our knowledge of the Lord Jesus. As I said earlier, uh, verses 1 to 4 are essentially one long sentence. And so in the Greek, there is actually a, a conjunction, there's a, a joining word at the beginning of verse 3. It's been missed off in the, the ESV. Some translations do, do have it. So Peter prays in, in verse 2 that our grace and peace may be multiplied, that we may have an abundance of grace and peace. And he says that will happen as our knowledge of God, as our knowledge of the Lord Jesus grows. But in the same way, the Lord Jesus Christ, by his divine power, he has granted to us everything that we need to live a godly life here in this world. But all those things, all that we need, <coughs> come to us in exactly the same way, through our knowledge of him. So are you struggling in your Christian life? Do you feel that you're lacking in grace and peace? Or in wisdom? Or in assurance? Or godliness? Or hope? Or self-control? Or usefulness? Or love? Or whatever it may be? Well, there's a very simple solution. Learn more about God. Learn more about the Lord Jesus. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Fill your mind with knowledge of him. Well, who is it that we are to grow in our knowledge of? Now, I've already said, isn't it? It's God and the Lord Jesus. But in verse 3, Peter says we are to grow in our knowledge of him who called us, him who called us to his own glory and excellence. Now, of course, Peter is talking here about the Lord Jesus. 
but he describes him as him who called us. He called us to follow him. And it was an effective call. When God's people hear the call of the Lord Jesus, they listen. We obey, don't we? We follow him. But why? Why, why is it an effective call? Well, think about Peter. Sometimes when you read it in the Gospels, the way uh, Peter's uh, account is recorded in the Gospels, it's almost as if Jesus turns up one day, he says to Peter, come and follow me, and Peter does. He immediately leaves his, his home, his family, his business, he leaves everything behind and he follows the Lord Jesus. But why? Well, Peter here tells us Jesus called him to his own glory and excellence. Believers see the glory and excellence of the Lord Jesus. And we are drawn to him. We are attracted to him irresistibly. And we see this, I think, quite clearly in Luke's account of that call of Peter. Now, we've looked at this before. This is in Luke and chapter 5. The account there is uh, Jesus uses Peter's boat as an as a impromptu pulpit to, to preach to the, uh, the large crowd on the shore of the lake. And so Peter has been there, hasn't he, listening to what the Lord Jesus uh, was saying. And remember, no one ever spoke like this man, man spoke. But then when Jesus finishes preaching, he, te he tells uh, Peter to, to go fishing. Now, Peter and his friends, they've been fishing all night and they haven't caught anything. But Peter knows, he recognises there's something, something about this man Jesus, something special about this man. And so Peter obeys and he, he does, he goes fishing. And of course, he pulls in that, that huge catch of fish. So many fish, they can barely even uh, bring them in in the nets. And Peter suddenly realises, doesn't he, that this man, Jesus, he has power even over the fish in the sea. And Luke writes, When they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Peter had to follow Jesus. He had seen something of his glory, something of his excellence. And so when Jesus called Peter to follow him, he did. He, he had to obey the call of the Lord Jesus. And every true Christian knows something of that call, that irresistible call of the Lord Jesus. It may not be in a one overwhelming moment as, as Peter had here. Perhaps it, it dawned on you very gradually, very slowly. But eventually we all come to that realisation, don't we? We come to see the glory and excellence of Jesus. We see his glory, his majesty, his perfection, his beauty. And we see that he is worthy to be worshipped. He is worthy to be followed. And so whatever the cost, you, you have to follow him. But what's the purpose uh, in all of this? Why have we been called? Why have we been saved? Why have we been given this great gift of, of precious faith? Well, Peter moves on to give us the answer to that question in verse 4. And there Peter says this. He has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. Now that's quite a long sentence. It's a long sentence that's part of the even longer sentence. So what is Peter saying um, here in this verse? Well, there are many places in the Bible, aren't there, where the, the Christian life is, is described in before and after terms. Once you were like this, but now you're like this. Once this was your situation, but now this is your situation. There are certain things that we, that we put off, 
that we put to death, that we, we leave behind. And there are other things that we now put on, that we seek after, that we pursue. Well, Peter is using that same sort of, of idea, that before and after picture here. At the end of verse 4, Peter says, if you're a believer, well, you have escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. You have escaped from the corruption that is in the world. And when God made the world, he made it good. But sin came into the world and corrupted that good creation. God's good creation was spoiled, was ruined. But how did sin come into God's good world? Well, the world was corrupted through sinful desire. What do we read in Genesis chapter 3, the account there of the fall? The serpent comes and, and tempts Eve to eat the forbidden fruit. And what we read is this. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and she ate. And of course, Adam ate as well. So Eve looked at the fruit. She desired the fruit. And so she ate the fruit. But it was a sinful desire, wasn't it? Because God had commanded that they mustn't eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so the world was corrupted through that sinful desire. But it's true for each one of us, isn't it? We all contribute in some way or, or another, don't we, to the corruption that is in this world. We've all at times given in to our sinful desires. And that's because in our, in our natural state, we are slaves to sin. We are trapped in sin. We're unable to escape because we cannot change our sinful desires ourselves. But when Christ called us, he called us out of our sins. He set us free from sin. By his saving power, we have escaped from sin. We have escaped from the corruption that is in this world because of sinful desire. But that's only part of the story, isn't it? Peter doesn't leave it there. We haven't just been set free from slavery to sin, amazing and wonderful as that is. Like Peter, we now have a new master to serve. So why then have we been set free from sin? Well, the answer Peter gives in the middle of verse 4. And there he says it's so that, so that you may become partakers of the divine nature. Now Peter is not suggesting here that, that we can become gods, that we can actually become divine, but God's purpose in saving his people is that we become like him, that we again share his nature. Let's go back in our minds to Genesis again, and this time right back to chapter 1. What did God say when he, when he made Adam and Eve? Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. So as human beings, we were created in the image of God. We were made to be like him, to reflect the very nature of God himself. But when Adam and Eve fell... That image was distorted. It was spoiled. It was corrupted. And ever since, every human being has been born similarly corrupt. But God didn't just give up on humanity. He didn't just write us off. No, even back there in the garden, God determined to restore what had been corrupted to fix the mess that we had made, to undo the curse. And he does that one sinful, 
corrupt human being at a time. He chooses to give us the gift of faith. He calls us to himself with that irresistible call. He sets us free from our sin, from the corruption that is in this world because of sinful desire. And he forgives our sin. He makes us clean as he is clean. He gives us a, a new heart, doesn't he? A clean heart. A heart that, that no longer desires sinful things. And he puts his spirit within us. We become partakers of the divine nature. He makes us like him again. He makes us ready for heaven. Ready to enter his holy presence. But we've not quite reached that point yet, have we? Because God hasn't yet taken us out of this corrupt world. For now, God calls us to go on living in a fallen world. To go on living in a corrupt world. And so, we have work to do. And one reason why God doesn't just take us out of the world immediately is that he is giving us time he is giving us opportunity to root out all the signs of corruption from our lives. Our goal in this life, as we continue to live as believers here in this world, our goal is to become as much like God as it is possible to be. Our aim must be, as Robert Murray McShane famously said and famously prayed, Lord, Make me as holy as a pardoned sinner can be. Well, how holy is that? How holy is it possible for a pardoned sinner to be? <coughs> well, in his first letter, Peter himself wrote this. As obedient children... Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Well, is that possible? Sounds good in theory, doesn't it? But, but is it possible? Is it even realistic? Is it actually possible for wretched, spoiled, corrupt sinners such as ourselves to become as holy as God is holy? Well, in these verses, Peter is trying to tell us that it's not just possible, but that it is certain. Remember again what Peter said in verse 3. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. The Lord Jesus has given us everything we need for a life of godliness. And we see one of the all things that God has given to us at the beginning of verse for he has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature. God has promised to make his people holy. So what are these precious and very great promises that Peter is referring to here. Well, you'll find them right throughout the Bible. I am sure of this, says Paul, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Now there, Paul is, is looking ahead, isn't he? He's looking ahead to the day when, when that process will be complete. When the Lord Jesus comes again. God has promised that on that day, he will complete the work of sanctification. Of restoring his image in his people. But he has begun that process 
here and now, here in this world. It is supposed to be an, an ongoing, a lifelong process, which is only brought to completion on that day. And so we find there are many precious and very great promises throughout the Bible where God promises to help his people, to uphold his people, to protect his people. Promises which show that our, our battle against sin is one that we can win. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. We know that our enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But God has promised, resist the devil and he will flee from you. And so we pray, don't we, as, as Jesus taught us to pray. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And Jesus promises that our Heavenly Father will answer such prayers. Just a few verses later, Jesus says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. And Jesus can promise an answer to such prayers because he is our great high priest. He intercedes for us. He makes our prayers acceptable to God. And of course, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathise with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. What about if we do stumble? What about if we do fall into sin? Or is that the end? Does that mean that we've it's all up? We've, we've forfeited our salvation? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And these are just a, a handful of the, the many precious and very great promises our God has made to us. I'm sure some of you will have your, your own favourites, things, that, verses that are coming to mind, these, these great promises that God has made. Well, do we believe that God will keep those promises? Do we believe that God will help us to live holy lives? To supply us with everything that we need to do so? Do we believe that he will strengthen us as we battle against sin? As we battle against temptation? Well, if we do, what should our response be? How does Peter want us to react in the light of these great promises how does peter want us to react are we to just sit back take it easy and well, look at what peter says next in verse five for this very reason because we have all these great promises for this very reason make every effort because God has given us everything that we need, because we have his precious and very great promises, therefore, Peter says, therefore we must make every effort, every effort to, to grow in grace, to grow in our knowledge, to grow in holiness and in godliness, to, to supplement our faith with all of the virtues that Peter lists out in verses 5 and following. Virtue, knowledge, self-control, steadfastness, 
godliness, brotherly affection, love. We are to make every effort to pursue those things. We are to continue our battle against sin, against the world, against the flesh, against the devil. To strive on, to work on, to battle on, because we know that it's not hopeless. We can battle on because we know that he will help us to succeed. We can, we can claim these precious and very great promises that he has made to us. We can become holy. And so what should we be aiming for here in this life? It's to become partakers of the divine nature. And nothing less. We mustn't settle for second best. We mustn't become presumptuous. We mustn't become lazy in our attitudes to sin. We mustn't become comfortable with our sin. We mustn't become comfortable with those besetting sins. We must look to the Lord Jesus for our example. He's, a, he's our example. He's our benchmark, isn't he? We are to look at his glory and excellence. We are to increase in our knowledge of him. We're to study how he lived, how he behaved, how he spoke, how he reacted. And we are to imitate him. When he comes, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. There's a day coming, isn't there, when we will be made perfect, when this, this great process of sanctification will be complete. But until then, we are to make every effort. Well, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, just as his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort.